Show. I'm delighted to introduce you to Ori Pomerantz, who is a technical writer at Optimism, who spent the last two decades teaching IT security and writing about IT security. So Ori's here with us today to talk about Optimism, and I'm happy to pass the mic over to you, my friend. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just a moment. Okay, Optimism Basics, the optimistic roll-ups. I'm also going to talk a little bit about zero knowledge rollups, but they're the competition. I don't know them very well, so I'm not going to say much. Okay, first, Ethereum is great. Don't get me wrong. I love Ethereum. I've written tests for the EVM, but we can't take over the world with Ethereum. Why? Limited capacity, congestion causes high gas costs. Now, but why is that? Every transaction is executed by thousands of computers on Ethereum. Every node executes every transaction so it can have the correct state. This means that anything you do on chain is very expensive. You don't want to use it for everything. So how do we fix it? Instead of using layer one or L1, which is essentially theory as a dispute resolution mechanism, uh, sorry, as the clearinghouse for everything, we'll use it as a dispute resolution mechanism. What do I mean by that? Imagine that uh, somebody gave you a check for $50. You don't go to court to, ca to cash a check for $50. You go to the bank and there are lots of banks. They compete for your business. They transfer assets between them. The only time that you go to court is if the check goes bouncy, right? Okay. Now, then why do we even have courts at all? Because the threat of being sued makes sure that checks don't usually go bouncy, bouncy. So this is what we're talking about. Essentially, turning L1 into our court, which yes, is expensive, but it's okay because you almost never go to court. One possible answer is roll-ups. Roll up all of the transactions, roll them up into L1. Now, why do we do this? Because L1 has excellent availability and integrity guarantees. However, the calculations of the results of transactions can be done elsewhere, and then it can be done a lot more cheaply. Uh, of course, the problem with that is I'm calculating the results, so we need to make sure that the reported results are correct. And there are two of them. One is zero-knowledge roll-ups. You calculate a zero-knowledge proof, and that is very expensive. But then the proof is verified on L1, can be verified on L1, and verifying a zero knowledge proof is cheap. So the L1 part is cheap. The fact that the zero knowledge proof is expensive is no big deal because it's only done once by the sequencer. So it's not a problem. There are some problems with zero knowledge though. Now remember, I work for optimism. I am not an expert on zero knowledge rollups, and I am talking about the technology that competes with us. So take this with a grain of salt. First, zero knowledge, who here understands zero knowledge proofs, the mathematics that make them tick? No one. Exactly. Now, because the mathematics is difficult, it may or may not be possible to run the EVM on them. If not, then you have to transfer everything to something that does work with zero knowledge proofs. Um, now, when I say it may or may not be possible to run the EVM, they are Turing complete. That means that they can run any program that you want, but you may not be able to run it with decent performance. Now, also another problem is that it's difficult to find people who can audit the code. Now, don't get me wrong. People who can do good audits are pretty rare. They need to understand security. They need to understand the system they're auditing. 
but we can find them. Finding people who will audit zero knowledge sequencer and things like that is even harder. So I'm not sure that this is the right solution, at least until we have enough people who can actually play with it and find holes in it. The other technology is optimistic rollups. Now, how do we work? Uh, you send your transaction and immediately or within a few minutes, we post your transaction on L1 and we also post the state route after your transaction. This, but nobody tr on L1 trusts that. Why? Because there's a fault challenge window that allow others to say, that state route you got us after that transaction? Are you crazy? That's not correct. And the way it works is it relies on economic incentives. If you are the sequencer and you post the correct result, there's some ETH in it for you. If you are a verifier and somebody in the sequencer posted an incorrect result and you dispute that, there's a reward in it for you. And of course, there are penalties. If you propose an incorrect result, or if you do a denial of service by disputing a correct one, your bond gets slashed. Some ETH goes to address zero where it's going to basically stay until the end of the world. And some ETH goes to the person who proved you wrong. Okay, how would we do this? I say, how would we do this? Because that part of our system isn't written yet. It's one of those things where doing the job quickly is not as important as doing the job, because if we do the job wrong, then people can lose hundreds of millions of dollars in the aggregate. Fault challenges. Um, they were the normal term. Oh, sorry. Did, did you raise your hand? Uh, quick question. Just what in particular were you saying hasn't been written yet? Is it the, the penalties and the rewards or just the penalties or something else? The fault challenge. We don't have them written yet. And I'll show the way that we do it and you'll see why it's complicated. There was an earlier implementation that Optimism thought was good. And then a friend of mine looked at it and found a bunch of holes in it. So they decided to wait do it slowly, make sure it's properly audited, which is why we don't have it yet. Gotcha. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyway, originally they were called fraud challenges. This is still a term some of the industry uses. Why do we call them fault challenges? We don't like the SEC, or at least we don't want the SEC to be too interested in us. When a regulator hears the term fraud, immediately the regulator goes and starts being very interested. We don't want that. So instead we call them fault. Also, it's more likely to be a sequencer fault than it is to be somebody trying to commit fraud because fraud is not very profitable when you get slashed for it. Now, how do we do it? There are two stages. First, there's bisection, which means uh, we try to find what step where it exactly happened, and then we execute a single step on L1. And by step, by the way, of code. Now, how does this work? Um, let's say that something is seven steps. It's a really simple transaction. <clears throat> and the proposer says that the initial state is S0. The challenger also agrees that it is S0. What they disagree with is the state after the transaction. The proposer says it's S7 and the challenger says, no, it's S7 tag. It's a completely different thing. What do we do? We cut the problem in half. We ask them, and when I say we have the smart contract on L1 that is verifying, what do they think is the state after step four? The proposer says S4. The challenger says, 
Are you crazy? Everybody knows it's S4 tag. So now we know that the disagreement between them is somewhere between step one and step four. And again, this is still multiple steps. We're lazy. We're going to cut the problem in half again. And um, we ask them, what is the state after step two? Now, in this case, the proposer says S2 and the challenger says, finally, you're telling the truth. You say it's S2 and you are right. So we know that the problem isn't in steps one or two, because after that, they both agree on the state. What do we do? Is we ask them, what is the state after step three? Now the proposer says, why, it's S3, of course, duh. And the challenger says, are you crazy? It's clearly S3 tag, it's a different one. So now we know that step two, they did the same and that they disagree on the result of step three. And of course, once they disagree on the state, they will continue to disagree on it. Okay, so now we know the step. Next, we are going to execute this one step on L1, publicly visible on the blockchain, and we'll see who is right. And there are two ways that to, do, to do it. The one that Arbitrum uses now is they transpile the EVM code to AVM, Arbitrum Virtual Machine, and they execute one AVM step. Optimism, on the other hand, the way that we are working on doing this is something called Canon. We compile a version of Geth to MIPS and we run MIPS on the EVM. Now, this sounds terrible because the performance of MIPS on running Geth on top of MIPS on top of the EVM, that is very slow. However, we only run a single opcode. And if it's just one opcode, then it's not that bad. Arbitrum, by the way, now have a project called Nitro, which is also to compile Geth to WebAssembly, I think. And then they will also do the same thing. Okay, so to put it all together, all the transactions are written to L. Sorry. Should I just save questions to the end? A question about that previous slide, but I can definitely save it to the end if Don't. that works better. You'll f so this is backwards to what I would think would be the better way to do it, which would be like the EVM and the AVM are more similar than something that gets compiled into MIPS and then running MIPS on the EVM. So why is that preferable? Because Arbitrum didn't do it that way and now they're changing. Or, or what am I missing in my assumptions? When you do EVM, you have to deal with all of the crazy edge cases. And there are a lot of them. If you ever went, go to GitHub slash Ethereum slash tests, there's hundreds or thousands of tests there. And there's a reason for it. The EVM is not simple. So it is simpler and more compatible to take Geth, which we already know works, and compile that and run that on the EVM. Because MIPS is designed to be simple to implement and the EVM is, not, is designed to be secure and consistent, but simplicity isn't as much of a consideration, I think. Cool, that makes sense. Thanks. You're welcome. So, the state commitment that you get, that people submit, that the sequencer submits is probably uh, accurate. Why? Because as long as there is one honest verifier, that honest verifier will start yelling, hey, no, that's the wrong state. Come on, you need to do this honestly and make sure that the state is correct if somebody submits an incorrect value. And because we slash people who lie, but we reward people who give us the truth, the economic incentives align with honesty. However, it also means that we need to give the verifier that fault challenge period to make sure 
that things are correct. This means that withdrawals to be done trustlessly have to take seven days. So at this point, we have a blockchain, but it can't communicate elsewhere. And if we were doing it this way, right from the start, from the original yellow paper, no problem. We aren't. We're retrofitting this into Ethereum now, and people already hold their crypto assets on Ethereum on L1, right? We don't really need to reinvent the wheel. Um, the assets are already there. And if people can't interact trustlessly with their existing assets on our blockchain, why would they use it? No blockchain's an island. Okay, blockchains are islands. The entities that you use to transfer assets are called bridges. And there are two types. There's trusted bridges, which means that you give your assets on one layer. It gives them to you on the other layer. It can be L1 to one. And usually that's okay. That's okay because it's a well-known trusted bridge. But if you want to transfer a thousand ETH, you might not want to do it like that. So you use a trustless bridge, which we provide you and which is as secure as the layer two it's using. So how does this work? Let's say that the user wants to transfer a thousand ETH. That's a big whale. The user sends the assets to the bridge on L1 and calls L1. When I say send, it's either sends it with the call or if it's ERC20, approves and then calls. The L1 bridge is going to hold the assets on L1 and send the message to the bridge on L2. The L2 is then going to mint the equivalent assets on L2. And they are backed one to one by those assets on L1. Does this make sense? One question that uh, send a message to bridge L on L2. How is that actually implemented? There's a contract, but what the contract does is it places a message in a queue. Then we have a piece of software that sees that and then sends the message. That is a piece of off-chain software. Now you're going to say, Ori, you told me this is trustless. It's not trustless because we trust that you'll actually do it, right? Yes, but if we don't do it, you can do it too. And if the sequencer doesn't include a transaction in L, going to L2, after a certain amount of time has passed, then the L2 is stuck. The only thing that you can add to the L2 from that point onward is uh, that transaction before you can continue running. And eventually somebody else will be able to run a sequencer. So even if we become evil, somebody else will be able to replace it. I have a, this, a follow up question to that. I'm, I'm curious more specifically, like how does the L2 validate that the transaction being reported to it from L1 is, what does that validation look like? It is signed transaction. And the transaction is signed by the entity that sends it. Sorry, it would have to rely on the piece of software that transfer messages. However, the way that you get the L2 state as anyone else on the chain, as any of the replicas, is you calculate it yourself. And the transactions, because they're all written to L1. So even if a L1 state is wrong, other people will have the correct L1 state because they didn't accept the fraudulent transaction. Oh, okay. So the bridge transactions, I guess you're using a bot that's reporting what's happening on L1 to the L2 and it's that reporting is being validated. Uh, yes, because that reporting affects the state. Right. And this, and the state is going to be, we're still working on it validated by every other replica. Okay. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Now we're trading that if we're using it, blah, 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 blah. 
eventually we have a user who wants to withdraw it back to L1. So the user calls the L2 bridge and the L2 bridge does two things. First, it burns the L2 assets because now they will no longer be backed by anything, right? And second, it sends a message to the L1 bridge saying, okay, release these assets to this and that or that address. What happens next? What did you just say? Nothing? Good, because that is what happens next. Nothing. The entire system is not doing anything because it needs to wait for default challenge window. Until the default challenge window passed, nothing is going to happen. After it passes, then the user can send the transaction to the L1 bridge saying, hey, those assets were burned because I asked to withdraw them. And the user sends a message to the L1 transaction to the bridge and the, the L1 bridge verifies the Merkle proof. It proves that the user withdrew and called the L2 bridge and then the user actually gets back the money, the ETH or the ERC20 token. I have a question that might be a naive one, but in yes. case everyone else is wondering too, is a seven day window for fault challenge really acceptable for folks who are trying to do things maybe quicker than a seven day window? Very good question. Not naive at all. And remember, there are no stupid questions except why don't we run Geth on top of MS-DOS? That one is pretty stupid. I'll show you the solution to that in a moment. That Merkle proof you mentioned, can you s speak a little bit more about it? What is that a set of? What are the elements in that Merkle tree? And how are they used uh, to sorry. provide security? I don't know that well enough to explain it. It would have to include the root of the tree would need to be the root that we uh, put, the root that is already on L1. But what exactly is included in the proof, that I'm not sure. Okay, but that's still very helpful because that you're saying that Merkle root is of the batches of transactions. For... No, it's not of the batches of transactions, it's of the state. Because the state will include mm. the fact that the L2 bridge burned that asset and sent that message. The transactions you don't need to prove, they're written as call data to L1. Everybody knows them. What you might want to prove is uh, messages because they're created by L2. So they're not really written anywhere. Okay. So what if you're sick and tired of this seven day wait and you want your ETH now? In that case, you use a trusted bridge, you send your assets to one layer and the bridge sends you the assets back on another layer. By the way, it doesn't have to just be L2 to L1. It can also be between one and Arbitrum. It can also be between us and Polygon whatever the bridge supports. And the way that it works is that the bridge has assets here and assets here. So you give it more here, it has less here, and it uses the, and to get those assets, it either has liquidity providers that it pays to, or it uses a trustless bridge to balance out the assets or I think pretty often both. Okay, so this is uh, my Optimism 101. Any questions? Oh, sorry, it's only half an hour. No need to apologize on the time. I thought that was quite comprehensive. I think we do have questions though. We have a thread going in Discord where a few people have posted some questions. I'm gonna take a look at that thread and I'll read them out one at a time. Then maybe you can address each one. In fact, we have a lot from Melville. Do you want to read off your own questions? And yeah, I do have a lot of questions there and I know we always have questions from other folks, so don't hold back. Can you talk a little bit more about the sequencer? And in particular, I'm just trying to understand if it has some additional permissions 
or functionality that a regular user wouldn't have. I'm just trying to understand how like centralized the sequencer is. So maybe just an intro on it and then specifically what are the permissions like for the okay. sequencer? The sequencer is the engine that runs everything because it accepts transactions and it can accept transactions that are posted on L1, but it can also accept transactions through other means and advance the L2 state and post the new L2 state to L1. So it has lots of permissions and it is centralized in a, right now, but once we get fault, fault challenges and fault proofs operational, we'll be able to decentralize it by making, let's say, something that people pay an auction fee for. Now, why would anybody want to run our sequencer and even be willing to pay for that privilege? Because it lets them, it lets them determine the order of transactions. They can't invent transaction out of whole cloth because transactions have to be signed by their original sender. However, they would be able to, once this is all operational, change the order of transactions and get minor extracted value. So essentially we are using MEV to pay for the blockchain, ex the L2 expenses. Cool. There is a lot there. Thank you. One quick follow-up to that. You said that it can update the L2 state without going through the regular inbox of L1 transactions. Did I understand that correctly? No, sorry. I didn't explain it well enough. Mm -hmm. What happens is that there are two ways to submit a transaction. Mm -hmm. The fast and cheap way is to talk directly to the sequencer. Mm -hmm. The slow, expensive, but uncensorable way is to execute the transaction on L1 and then the sequencer within a certain amount of time has to include that transaction. Cool. And it's cheaper because the sequencer batches up 20 transactions into one. Exactly. Thank you. That clears up a big You're confusion for me. Thanks. You're welcome. I probably need to add another slide. Actually, I am going to give this again. So I'm going to treat this as beta testing and based on questions, add more slides. Belville, yes, I'm using you. We're using each other. Belville, I really like the question you wrote about induced demand. Can we hit that one? I'm just going to keep reading from here until uh, I don't know, someone tells me to stop. So another question to order from Chabu is when auditing projects on optimism, are there any specific things to pay attention to? For example, if Uniswap is audited on optimism, are there any specific things to audit in addition to what you would look for on L1? The answer to that is no. We're EVM equivalent. We run a version of GES that is not that different from the GES that you all know and love. At least I hope that you love it because you'll be probably be talking to it a lot. The only time that you might need to include more things in an audit is if your application talks between L1 and L2. Uniswap does not, it just, it can swap L2 assets to for L2 assets or L1 assets for L1 assets. I have a follow-up question to that. I recently read in the Uniswap docs to, they just strongly discourage relying on a TWAP used on optimism because block.timestamp is referring to the timestamp on L1 and not the L2 timestamp. I'm curious if you're familiar with that and if that's still the case. I am familiar. I submitted the change, a pull request to change it. They haven't done it. The issue is that our timestamps used to be laggy, which would allow people to create a price that is very different from the L1 price of an asset. Now they're only laggy by about 15 seconds and coming soon when we release our next version bedrock, 
I think the, I lost you like for the last five seconds. Five How many seconds, seconds do you think? Sorry. I think the lag will be two seconds. Okay. Now, don't take that as the absolute truth because I'm not one of the people writing Bedrock. I'm doing documentation. And while I need to write the documentation for Bedrock, I haven't done it yet. Shh, don't tell anyone. So I'm not sure, but I think that the time difference would only be two seconds. Okay. Do you know like what would be a good way to, to look into that in the future? The best way to look for that would be to have a contract that writes into storage the output of the timestamp opcode and just call this contract on L1, call it on L2, compare the results, call it again a second later, compare the results and do that for a certain period of time. You could also look in the source code, but I think that the safest solution is not to ask the source code, not to ask the people who run the system, to ask the system itself. Any more questions? So another question is, do you worry about induced demand at optimism? So this is the idea, I've heard this idea used in terms of like civil engineering when you're building bigger roads. So the idea is that the bigger roads you build, the more cars will choose to use the roads. And then in the end, you don't solve congestion. You just have more people using the roads for things that are weren't quite useful enough before when the roads were small. But now that the roads are bigger, they can afford to use the roads for whatever they wanted. Maybe it's going and worried uh, about it. That's what we want to happen. L look, let me explain first why we really want this to happen. And second, how will we handle it if it gets to be too much? Right now, Ethereum is something that is only used by early adopters and mostly technical geeks. There is a whole world out there uh, with about a billion people who can't do banking because they can't trust contracts. They have a problem cooperating with each other because they can't get trustworthy contracts. Usually because the justice system in their country is useless. I mean, this is one of the things that keep third world countries. Now, if you're so poor that you don't have access to any computer, to the internet at all, then we can't help you. But in a lot of those places, people do have smartphones. We want to be able to provide banking. And by we, everybody in Ethereum, banking and ultimately other services to those people. So we need induced demand. Now you're going to ask me, what are you going to do if the induced demand is so high that the cost of running a sequencer becomes astronaut that you need the world's strongest computers to run a sequencer, right? Instead of uh, having one optimism layer two, we'll have two of them, three, 10, however many it takes. And that way we can scale. And as long as uh, it's okay that certain services don't talk to each other quickly, we can scale horizontally as far as we'd like. And you elaborate on the idea of as long as the two services don't need to be speaking to each other. Do you mean if there's two subsequent calls? I don't know. Maybe could you just elaborate there? Oh, yes. Remember that to sending a message from L2 to L1 trustlessly takes a week. Mm -hmm. Sending a message from L2 to another L2 will take the same amount of, will also take that week because the only way that they trustlessly communicate is through L1. So if we have to scale horizontally, that is how we're going to have to do it because we want to send messages trustlessly. And to be able to do that, and that means that let's say the price of ETH on Uniswap on Optimism 1 could vary a bit from the price of ETH on 
optimism too. And uh, while you can do arbitrage, it takes a week to transfer it from one to the other. And yes, this, please, this is the problem we want. So when I had asked a question about the sequencer, you had mentioned that there is going to be MEV incentivization for people running their own sequencers. And one question is, have y'all considered not incentivizing MEV? Is it possible to have a sequencer that we know will fairly, whatever that means, order the, the transaction? Maybe, I'm not sure why, but that seems desirable. I don't see how, as long as we run the sequencer, yes, as long as, and everybody trusts us, we can do transactions on a first come first serve basis. But how are you going to know what is the first come first serve basis for a sequencer? You can't use the timestamp because two transactions can have the same timestamp and because of network lagginess. So. If you're going to do that, pretty much you have to use, you have to accept that there's going to be minor extracted value. Just try to seek some clarity on that. My understanding is transactions are submitted in a certain order to a smart contract on L1, and then they are picked up by a bot, by some surfer that's off chain, and then they are supplied to an L2 server. Is that correct? Um, no, or rather it's correct, but partial. Um, what happens is that transactions are provided either through L1, or if you want your transactions to be cheap, if you don't want to pay L1 gas prices, and let's face it, you don't want to pay them if you're using optimism, they can be submitted directly to the sequencer. Okay. And that's why you can't order them. I see because you want to enable the second channel. Thanks. Even for the layer yeah. one, it's yeah. going to be a sequencer somewhere that says this transaction arrived first, this transaction arrived second. And in theory, that transaction, that sequencer can also get MEV. How do I use the sequencer? What do I need to set in my MetaMask to use the sequencer versus using the, the regular right to L1? I'm glad you asked. Let me show you our help center. Okay. Getting started. You can go to Chainlink and enter the ID for us, which is 10. Or alternatively, you can go in MetaMask, Chainlist.org, and we are looking for optimism. And here you go, connect wallet. I can't really do it in my case because it's already done, but that's it. You can just go to chain list. So then just so I understand. So if we're using chain ID 10, that will default to the sequencer. And so we'll have the, the cheaper transactions. Exactly. Now the way Prove that it. you use it in MetaMask is after you set this up is if you look in MetaMask, you have here networks. Optimistic Ethereum is us. Optimistic Coven is also us, but it's uh, the test network where you can use Coven E. And if you want to add the net, if you want to add us manually, you can use HTTPS mainnet.optimism.io. Or alternatively, if you look in our docs, no, not Solidity Docs. And you look at tools, network and public RPC endpoints, you also see that we have providers and they can provide you with a commercial uh, endpoint, which is probably better if you're going to create a high performance DAP because our endpoint is rate limited. This might be a juicy one. What's the thorniest technical challenge you've seen the Optimism team face and solve? Or another way, what's just like a fun story from the trenches of working on optimistic rollups? I'm trying to think. I don't really have that much because 
I'm off in my own world writing documentation. This one might also be far out there, but you seem like a great person to talk to about it. So I've read some headlines about these L2 data availability chains. I can't actually remember one right now, but the idea behind it is we're going to have some cheap way of making the transaction data that you need for data availability available to the L2s, but somehow it's going to be cheaper and better. It cool. sounds like snake oil to me, or maybe I just understand it wrong, but could you just give a primer on what these things are? What you're talking about is blobs. And there's an EIP, I think 4484. No. Anyway, there is an EIP out there for blobs and blobs are essential ah eight four four eight four four and the way that this work that this is work going to work again okay four eight four four you can look it up on google anyway uh, that is to have separate data storage and that data storage will only last for a month and that is why it's going to be a lot cheaper. And if we do that, then that allows us to store the transaction data for a month. That is long enough <laughs> for people to actually verify it for the verifiers. And we'll have the state available somehow, but we won't keep the transaction data forever. Now, when I say we won't keep it forever, I just mean that L1 with all of its availability guarantees won't keep it forever. Probably you will have somebody like Etherscan that will keep it forever. It just won't have the same kinds of guarantee. So you'll need to be able to make the state always available by other means than calculate history from the beginning. That's fascinating. Thank you. Anthony, do you want to take over? I got to uh, bounce for office hours. I have to bounce out for the next thing too. So I think at this point, yeah. okay. we've reached the end of our a lot of time. I want to just say, Ori, thank you so much for coming in. This was a super interesting talk. You are always welcome to come back anytime you want.